Yeah, we're professionals here. At least one of us is. I don't know about you. <laughs> hey, what is going on, you guys? Welcome to One of Each, the Dumb and Hungry podcast, where we talk about our food adventures and our favorite food groups. I'm Angelo, the Dumb and Hungry. Not much, though. And thank you for joining us. I hope you're doing all right. My child, it's nice to see you. It seems like every time you just seem full of life and energy. and Only in the beginning, yes. <laughs> it just kind of drops off. Oh, yeah. By just... the time this is over, I'm dead. <laughs> well, don't die just yet. We still got stuff to... <laughs> still, still on your contract there to... Yeah, Fulfill. not able to until at least another year of this. <laughs> Tell the people, our listeners particularly, what uh, what you're enjoying tonight, what you got there. Oh, it's just Hornell chili. Is it Hornell or Hormel? I don't know. Can, <laughs> can chili. Can chili. The, the, yeah, the, the regular old, the, the brand that's, I think, the only one. I don't actually know. There are various types of can chili out no, no, there. No, 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 no. We're sponsored now. The <laughs> red can. Um, okay. And sounds Ritz good. crackers. Gotcha. As well. The, the ultimate other crackers are the available. ultimate pairing, of course. Uh, well, for a good weeknight. You know, I normally eat chili with rice. Mm -hmm. We don't have a rice cooker. We Wait still don't have a rice cooker. That's just so bizarre. That yeah. this is an Asian household. Yeah. How could there be no rice? It's there's fro there's microwavable rice. There's just no rice cooker. Still, that's still odd. You could go to um, you can go to like a Goodwill or something and just pick up like a a rice cooker for like three dollars. You Look, know, I was advocating just like cheap rice cooker, or whatever, like a regular old Black and Decker. Mm -hmm. Always like no, it has to be Tiger brand because well, that's what she grew up with. Yeah, you know, I kind of agree there. Like, I wouldn't buy. Uh, I would have to buy an Asian brand, you know, uh, like it can't be the elephant though. She, she's there. Oh, that's her arch rival. Wait a minute. What's wrong with the, that's the one I was going to go for <laughs> the Zo it's, Zoji Rushi. Yeah. You know? is, is it Rushi? Yeah. It's something like that. Zoji Rushi. Absolutely. And that it makes like, you know, the banger of like, uh, you know, these little chiming tunes when you start cooking the rice or whatever, you know, that's why she wants a tiger brand one. Cause that's the one she grew up with. Okay, but so does it's, that it's brand loyalty? Okay, but does it give you the sick beats? I mean, like supposedly, I don't know. I've never, I don't know. I haven't heard it. Hmm. I have to look at that. But that's the next purchase because hmm. we just bought a Dyson. So that's the next uh, thing. But a Dyson over a rice cooker. A rice cooker. This yes. is very bizarre conversation we're having. I don't know who I'm talking to now, but okay. <laughs> look, man, we needed a, <laughs> this. The carpet in that room was starting to get gross. Okay. Oh. <laughs> okay. Well, it was riddled with rice, you know, because it's not being cooked. So it's like being spread all over the place. So like a if, wedding. You, if you cook the rice, <laughs> it wouldn't be a problem. Remember that Russell Peters skit? No, remind but, me. Uh, I don't remember it in detail, but he was like, imagine a an Indian and a Chinese wedding. Mm -hmm. Like, you know how much rice would be at that wedding? <laughs> I kind of remember that. Yeah. It'd yeah. be a lot of rice. Different yeah. types of rice, maybe long grain, some short grain. I don't know. Not a lot of brown rice. Hell no. You know. That would not be. Okay. <laughs> okay, well. Yeah, so there's that. I, you know, I forgot to mention, I guess I forgot last time or the last couple of times. Um, have you ever been, uh, have you heard of the, a sushi place here in Little Tokyo called Sushi Hama? Hmm. Sounds familiar, but I don't think I've been. Uh, yeah, I went one uh, recently with Oli, and okay. she really likes it. It's like a really old, it's like a traditional place okay. where all they serve is sushi. Like they have signs in the at the door saying no chicken teriyaki, no noodles. It's all, it's just sushi. Okay. Well, it's, I would hope so. I mean, just a straight up sushi bar, it seems. Yeah. It's really cool. What did you I order like from this, there? Uh, I mean, we got a bunch of stuff. What was it? The salmon toro. They had the, 
I think Yellow Tail Toro as well. Mm -hmm. Sweet Shrimp. Um, it's a la carte, so there's that. It's okay. not all you can eat, but it's good quality. It looks like it's... Where is it? They're on... Um, I don't know, down on 2nd Street there. Yeah, right next to us. Technically, I don't know about everybody, but... They, they, I, when Oli went there the first mm -hmm. time with another friend, they were like, you can't, you, you can't take pictures or you be on your phone or anything like that. Mm. So that's interesting. But then when I went there the other day with Oli, yeah. there were a couple of people that were just taking pictures and they didn't care. But they're also regulars. Like they, talk, they knew them by name. So oh. I don't know if that's part of it. Mm. But yeah, it seems like a super small, like a local business kind of thing because they have, they know the regulars. Like people walked in like, oh, hey, I haven't seen you in a while kind of thing, which is nice. Very cool. Looks like they have a location as well on the west side, oh. which is cool. But yeah, it looks like a, I mean, I'm sure we've, you know, passed by this place many times, you know, and yeah, I really too. have. But um, it's kind of nice to find out these small gems, right? Yeah, it's really cool. Okay. It's just three guys making sushi for you. Can't ask if you have a better. party of four, you go in a different room at the table, but ev everyone else seats at the bar. Very cool. Yeah, it looks uh, looks really good. That's yeah. Hama Sushi. Yeah, they just make it and then put it right on your plate when they're done with it. It's great. Nice. How about you? Where have you been in the last few, or I guess in the last week? In this last week? Um, a few places, a handful of places. Um, I, I guess since, <laughs> uh, you know, um, our, my recent visit to, to New Orleans, I've kind mm -hmm. of been having that in my mind, maybe, uh, you know, just trying to, trying to find places, um, that will bring me back, I guess, short of actually going back. That's the thing, you know, as you know, diverse as LA is, mm -hmm. um, it kind of makes you kind of motivates me to, to look for places that, um, you know, and just see how to see how, what kind of things I can find, you know, with it's uh, as diverse as it is. So, yeah. Um, okay. as far as new Orleans, you know, food and that kind of stuff goes, I, uh, came across a restaurant not too far from, um, from where I am. It's called, uh, called Darrow's and they're, um, they're out in Carson and they make, uh, food, you know, New Orleans, uh, style food, Creole. Um, so it's called Darrow's New Orleans Grill. And, uh, I think I remember having there had a, uh, had some gumbo that they had, which is a, which is a stew, you know, uh, usually thickened with, uh, like a roux, which is flour typically, or some other thickener, but usually some really deep flavors in there. Um, you know, uh, some, uh, what were the vegetables? The the key vegetables like celery, carrots, the onion, um, and then you usually have it with you know certain meats, seafood, um, and things like that. So um, gumbo was a very gumbo was a very Creole uh, comfort food for sure, and uh, theirs was I mean flavor wise was uh, was really good. I really enjoyed it. Um, and they also served out some po boys as well, which was which nice. pretty good. Um, they're not quite at the size that uh, I had remembered, but I think uh, as far as flavor and everything, they were they're pretty pretty on it. So okay, uh, that was a good so, good uh, spot there. Mm -hmm. So so where does Creole rank in your uh, food pyramid? I'm not quite sure. Um, it's it's uh, obviously not the base like barbecue or. Burgers. Yeah, yeah, but it's um, it it carries. It definitely carries okay. some of these other groups. So okay. as I'm nice. learning to learning more about it, I think it's becoming pretty uh pretty high in my mind here. Nice. Yeah, but uh, there are a handful of Creole and uh, maybe Cajun style restaurants that. Um, I've come that I've kind of started looking into and oh, hopefully wow. will maybe at least pay a visit, but I think I need to bring, uh, someone along. I'm looking at you, my child, but <laughs> trying to bring someone along. Cause, um, I think the food, uh, 
what they're serving and every I think it's better shared, I'll put it that way. Mm. So okay. but um in addition to that, as far as other places, um I went back to uh this burger spot proudly serving. They're out in um uh this I mean this particular visit was out in Long Beach uh at uh, Beachwood Brewing and um they have some great smash burgers over there and uh, they wow. recently added an item that includes uh pork tongue pastrami Ooh, and uh, okay. i thought that was really good super flavorful uh the pastrami was nice and brined a uh, great flavor the meat itself was you know um was great and uh yeah i mean it's uh just makes the burger just a little more rich but um it was uh was pretty good nice so, out there um and then kind of continuing on this new orleans kind of kick kind of um and you know you're familiar with the spot uh gus's mm -hmm. fried chicken and um um i think yeah if i understand correctly they were they're originally based out there in um in louisiana oh, if i really if i'm not mistaken huh. but um yeah uh so had a relatively simple meal. It's a two piece, you know, leg and thigh with some, uh, and it comes with coleslaw and beans. And they also added an order of uh, mac and cheese and some fried okra. So, Can't go wrong with fried okra. Ooh. Yeah. I mean, the, the okra was, uh, oh, fried okra. was a really nice bite, super crispy and uh, nice, like cut into nice small pieces. And then they serve okay. it with a side of, uh, a ranch. So it's a of nice, course. Of yeah. Course. But the, um, mm -hmm. Question. Gus is world famous fried chicken? It sure is. Fact check. Uh, founded in Mason, Tennessee. Just saying. Okay. Well, it was uh it was delicious either way. <laughs> well, I think to your... I think I recall that um you know, uh I think when people I, when I was kind of looking at, you know, some places to visit as far as uh, fried chicken goes in New Orleans, I think people did suggest that oh, spot. Really? I ended, okay. I mean, I didn't end up going, but I, I maybe that's why it kind of stuck in my mind that way. But you're saying it's oh, cool. uh, from Tennessee. So, yeah. okay. All right. Well, that's why, uh, that's why you're here to help. Uh, Call you out on your. Uh... <laughs> that's correct. Uh, gladly that I will gladly do that every time. All right, great. Um, but uh, I will say, all those along with a with a drink, uh, I don't know. Uh, eating out is obviously getting you know pricier as we yeah. yeah yeah probably pay close to thirty five bucks for that meal. God damn! But you know the chicken was just as good as I remember it. Uh, even though it's been a while since I've had it, nice and crispy. You know, um kind of a nice spice to it and the chicken itself is uh you know nice and moist so um can't really complain um you know too much there and you know it was on a it's a sunday afternoon so it wasn't actually too busy okay. um, a nice nice vibe in there nice quiet uh atmosphere and yeah just good service all around so very happy about that um i didn't mean it to go to the gust that's right I forgot about the one that's by here yeah, so we have they have the mid city one. They have one in uh, Burbank. Um, they have a handful of places as well. They actually had one yeah. in, uh, out in Long Beach, not too far, but they okay. had closed that location down actually recently. Oh. Yeah, which is too bad. Oh well, um, but I got my fix and was happy about that. Um, and then lastly, for me, um, I had to revisit um, Levin Bakery. Um, out in Larchmont Village, only because you know I'm a sucker for these large cookies. Thick ass cookies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they are thick. Um, it's they're they're really something else, and they were just as good, uh, just as delicious as I remember having them. Mm. And um, yeah, they just if you have a chance, if you know if you haven't been or anyone else, um, yeah, I mean they're oh, man, you could probably share them. Arguably, <laughs> I won't. <laughs> probably could yeah so just had what the chocolate chip walnut which is probably the most mm. common or popular one and then there is also this double this dark chocolate chocolate chip 
So that that was uh pretty good too. They have a I uh, remember to go. Oops, yeah, sorry. yeah, no, you should. Uh they have a yeah. uh limited edition flavor at the oh. moment. I don't know if it's unique to LA or but they have a Rocky Road flavor as well, which hopefully mm. we can try next time out there. But yeah, but uh Leven, um in this case Usually they're long lines, and they're still a line. Um, oh, really? But probably didn't wait more than about fifteen minutes for yeah. uh, to order. Well, what time did you? Go? Oh, you want a weekend? Huh? It's like a yeah, again, uh, maybe around two or three in the afternoon. All so right. not, not. I bad. don't know. I pass by it. Well, I pass by Largemont on the way to work every time. So. Do you pass by it on take. the way back? <laughs> Both. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so maybe a good chance to, um, yeah, take a well, break from yeah. the, the traffic, you know, on the way, and then just kind of take a cookie break. Yeah, I actually think about it, because that makes sense. I hate driving. Well, and then when you're there, either before, during, or after, you take a visit to Salt and Straw right across the street, <laughs> get some ice cream. And then, you know, I think if you're Jenny's is still there, Jenny's is still the there, as well. still down the there street. You so yeah, you're no shortage of options there. I lo- do, do you know how long that uh, limited flavor is? I don't know. We can do some research, I guess, but I don't, yeah. I don't know offhand, but, um, yeah, give it a shot. Love in. Very cool. Um, but yeah, speaking of more food, I wanted to continue just, um, Catching up here on the many great bites and places uh, visited in the city of New Orleans. Uh, apparently, our conversation last time wasn't enough to contain everything uh, that uh, I've uh, had the chance to visit and try. Of course not. Is Ar- you? I know. Arguably, um, I could have narrowed it down, you know, maybe to a few greatest hits or something, but that's not how not we're working. Not the first here. time there. Oh, yeah. come on. So here, uh, here it comes. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, from last time we we talked about some great spots, places that served, uh, of course, uh, the iconic beignets, uh, po boys, um, a great, um, like a great uh, fancy dinner, you know. Um, Orleans barbecue sauce. Yes, bar- I can't stay away from barbecue, that's for sure. <laughs> and I think we'll see that again um, pretty shortly, but uh, there's more to come. But yeah, we're here to talk about more food, uh, more food adventures here out in uh, in New Orleans. So um, here we go. <laughs> uh, this first spot we're going to start off with here is, um, you know, apparently there are other spots that uh sell beignets coffee du monde oh, is yeah. not the be all end all there are other spots that exist in this world um who would have guessed, who would have guessed? well um i found out that way but i wanted to start my day uh with uh, a beignet and mm. um i did kind of do some research and kind of look into other spots that sell beignets and you know what what are the better ones out there and so this one was uh, a spot called uh, morning call coffee stand and um, they're out near the city park area of, uh, of New Orleans actually uh, so I was kind of out there uh, the previous day but I, I didn't stop by this spot I had kind of had it planned already uh, as to um, in my itinerary but this actually is located right across the street from uh, where one of the trains, uh, one of the streetcars, and one one of the buses um, terminal kind of ends here, and it's right across from several cemeteries. Um, but That's it's a good sign. yeah, it's good. It's like comfort yourself with some beignets. Um, <laughs> but it is not a too far walk if you're on your way to City Park. But um, let's bring up a little bit on what we're looking at here. So these are the beignets from Morning Call. So it doesn't have quite, you know, it's not exactly the same vibe as being out at Café du Monde at the French market, you know, with this kind of outdoor setting with a, you know, with the live music and and the liveliness out there. But it's got a vibe. It's got a nice, um, you know, it's got a nice cafe kind of, you know, setting. And um, it's in a kind of, you know, more typical uh, 
you know, uh, complex of other small restaurants and things. Okay. But here we see uh, the the beignet, the fried dough um, with the uh, with the powdered sugar and and all that. And similarly, nowhere near as much though. Well, I'm going to get to that in a little bit as to why that cool. is. Um, and, um, but similarly to Café du Monde, you can, um, you would, uh, come in, you would sit yourself and, um, someone will come up to serve you, take your order, hmm. you know? Um, so these are the, they got the beignets, you know, they got the Café au lait. Um, but interestingly enough, I think this is kind of what, to what you were kind of asking, um, last time, you know, are there uh, like, what is their menu like, right? What else do they mm -hmm. serve? And in this case, they have a little more of an extensive menu. They serve other, um, you know, types of food, um, including things like gumbo and jambalaya. Mm -hmm. I think they have some sandwiches there. Um, so a little more to the menu than just, uh, beignets, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, but I wanted to also pull up a little bit, if I can. Uh, there was a little bit of the interior, so you can kind of get a little bit of an idea of what you're working with here. Again, it's a nice kind of um, charming spot. So this is kind of a view inside. There's a lot of, there are a number of tables, regular tables, but you see this kind of counter space as well, um, where you can sit and enjoy your um, your beignets and your cafe au lait, you know? So let me go back to, um, to the beignets. So you had just commented something I was just thinking. It's like, oh, there's not as much powdered sugar in there. And let mm -hmm. me, let me share you this picture and maybe give you an idea why. When they serve the, the beignets, they do not serve them with powdered sugar. Huh. And in fact, you need to, well, at least from my experience, maybe I, I had to end, you know, there, there are um, containers or canisters of the powdered sugar at your table that you okay. then kind of dispense upon the, uh, the beignets. Right. Okay. No, I don't, fine. I don't know if it's something that I missed, if it's something I can request specifically, you know, like saying, oh, can I get those, you know, with powdered sugar already? Um, but I ended up having to do the work myself. <laughs> and let me tell you, even though these beignets were actually pretty good, it, they were actually, they had a little bit more of a fry to them um, than Cafe Du Monde. So there's a little bit more of a density there. This is a deal breaker, man. I got to serve myself. What is going on <laughs> here? Powder sugar on. I mean, how long how, for that amount of powdered sugar? How much work was it really? So, it it's a lot. Okay, it's too much. Oh, was it really? Because right. you know, for the container, you know, uh, was it like a sifter, the the squeeze sifter things. No, no, it's just like oh. uh, I don't even know. It's just like this container that has the small holes on top, but the holes I feel like are too small. And you know oh. how all the powdered sugar gets compacted and then it's mm -hmm. kind of hard to shake shake out. So what the technique is to even get some decent amount of sugar, it's like, um, you know how you have the priests, right? And they're like um, shaking the uh, uh, the scepter, you know, of uh, holy water. <laughs> of holy water? Right? Yes. You, you flick of the wrist, right? You know what I'm talking about? You flick the wrist. I know exactly what you're talking about, yes. Yeah. Uh, cast a blessing. <laughs> Upon the beignets. And so I feel like that's... That sounds like it's a mess. Well, well, like we've we've discovered before, you know, eating beignets with powdered sugar is never... Um, it's never going to be a, a tidy task. Yeah, but I mean, it sounds like more of a mess. Because if you flick, doesn't it just get all over the table? Well, yeah, this, uh, this table was not brown for long. I see. Yeah. <laughs> It was uh, it was definitely a, a challenge, but um, I think once you get the the powdered sugar in there, um, I think uh, it was definitely infinitely enjoyable. So um, it was still a great great beignet overall. I'm not gonna not gonna take away from that. Um, the cafe au lait was also pretty good, um, similar to um, 
uh, Cafe Du Monde. But um, I think still between these two so far, I think Cafe Du Monde, I think overall, you know, still a great. Just because less effort. <laughs> well, there's that, you know, and also comparing the Cafe Au Lait. Oh, okay. taste from cafe du monde I, oh, okay. I think i appreciate it a little more but nothing nothing bad about here i mean cafe lait is just as common as you know any other beverage so you mm-hmm. know it'll come in many different you know forms and preparations and things like that so still a great great addition overall but um yeah i mean i just call me surprised right just the fact that had to serve my own powdered sugar i think if you get it to go though i think they will you know certainly serve it with the powdered sugar in there. So maybe that's, maybe that's the key, <laughs> you know, it's like, I'll take it to go. And then you just end up sitting down. It's like, um, but yeah. Uh, but that's a uh, morning call, uh, coffee stand. Yeah. Not bad. Not bad. Uh, this was a great, start. this was a good start on my way to, um, one of the, the plantation that I visited. Oh, which we'll, right. Might talk about later. Not now. Cause it's not food related. Um, moving on, <laughs> but, uh, after that, um, as I did mention, uh, from the plantations, I, I made my way back, um, and about halfway back, yeah, maybe halfway back to, uh, New Orleans, there's a town, a uh, neighborhood, uh, called, uh, Metairie. And, um, originally there were a number of, um, spots I wanted to visit there, um, but scheduling just didn't work out. But I did end up going to one restaurant out there um, called Drago's. And uh, Drago's is um, one of a handful of, of restaurants that people go to for, uh, namely, namely for seafood, but specifically for um, charbroiled oysters. Oh. Yeah. So, I mean, I think here, at least from my experience, I'm just used to having like um, fresh oysters, you know, um, nice sea brine, you know, fresh. Uh, but, um, I don't know if I've had, uh, oysters prepared this way. I'm sure I've had like fried oysters too, Mm -hmm. you know, um, which are just as delicious, but, um, charbroiled is definitely a, a different, different take, uh, that people really enjoy. And I was sure to enjoy as well. But, um, they're out there. They actually have a, um, if you're out in the French Quarter, they do have a location there, um, along with um, the other places I was kind of referring to as Acme Seafood, and I think Felix is another place, but um, and Drago's is in the conversation there. But um, people suggest to visit the Metairie location, and since it was you know on my way back, then I decided, yeah, I should definitely visit this place. So um, sure enough, I did. And I should be able to bring up something here. These are the charbroiled. This is one of those places, again, it's like, why are the nice restaurants dark? You know, I, <laughs> um, it's hard to take is that pictures. Another, is, that, is that a Barks, uh, Barks cup over there, I see? It sure is. Yet another bottle of Barks root beer. Let's um, go. So <laughs> big fan, big fan. But you can see here the um uh, the 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 oysters. So is that the you, shell too? Yeah, with the shell. These are thick. These are thick boys. Um pretty large shells. The payoff payload is actually surprisingly I don't know, the uh, you still get a lot, but not as much as I was hoping for. Let's put it that way. Well. But yes, it includes the uh, the shells there. And you didn't those, are, those, did you? Uh, I well, you know, you tried. <laughs> not, not at a lack of trying, but yeah. Oh, okay. But um, you can see basically the solu- the, the the formula here is that ev- everything is made better with cheese and butter. You know. Hell yeah. Yeah. So if ever you get a chance to like even watch some of the guys that are on the grill um, uh, cooking these things, it's it's like a work of art. It's an art form. Oh, really? It is delicious. Um, so yeah, but but those are uh, charbroiled. I mean, it's nice. It's still got that great, obviously, quality, that fresh quality of the of the oyster, a little brininess in there, but obviously add a little, a lot more savoriness with the cheese and the butter and some of the herbs that are finished off there. 
you make it you make it a little lighter with squeezing a little lemon and um yeah i mean it's just a, a wonderful a wonderful bite i have to see if there's something out here um where they serve serve that but this is drago's is definitely up there as far as where you should visit to uh, try this kind of food um one other thing i wanted to mention uh, a couple of the other items this wasn't a particularly large meal i tell you actually these are this was half a dozen um oysters i i probably should have gotten the full dozen but i don't think i would have made it back on time um with any room to spare but I think that was just perfect, along with some of these other items that I tried, particularly um, one being the uh, fried boudin balls. And uh, we've talked about boudin previously, but uh, in a uh -huh. slightly different preparation. Um, in a less safe for work preparation. <laughs> I think so. Uh, but this is also also a little risky, too. I don't know. Um, fried crispy balls. Uh <laughs> of of uh based on a on a nice sausage but uh the fried boudin uh balls are as we said boudin is a, a sausage encased casing stuffed with uh rice and meat you know and onion you know those kinds of things just highly spiced and um in this case it's prepared you know it's breaded and fried and yeah i mean that Frying things, I think, also makes things infinitely better. Definitely. Um, so um, that was definitely a great... This is probably a little more than maybe what I was uh, maybe used to or expecting as far as a boudin goes. Uh, M maybe not maybe not exactly this preparation, but um, I don't know. Just, just something with a little more... Um, um, yeah, that fry factor definitely definitely brought it up a bit. So good. Um, but in addition to that, I also ordered a small uh, side of of gumbo, and um, as we just kind of talked about earlier, uh, gumbo is is a stew. It's a Creole uh, quintessential dish, um, and it's the the stew is usually thickened, you know, like with a with a roux, which is typically flour and oil or, um, and um, or some other thickener. I think historically you could use things like okra to, to do it as well. Um, but your, your gumbo can all is uh, with a, usually flavored with a, you know, a flavor heavy stock uh, along with, you know, your proteins, whether it's seafood or, um, you know, certain meats or anything, and then um, different vegetables as well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and then you in this case served along with some rice. Uh, there are some distinctions between, you know, Creole and uh, Cajun style gumbo, um, and uh, I'll just tell you, you know, this um, this in itself was was very good. It, it was very this particular one um, was actually my first foray, you know, first taste of gumbo here in New Orleans. So. Um, it was definitely had a deeper flavor. Um, I think if they used, if they had it with a roux, it was definitely like a darker, very much cooked um, for longer. So it has a roastier, you know, flavor, I would say. Um, but even with a small, you know, a small serving, definitely had served a lot, a lot of flavor. And along with everything else with the boudin balls and the, and the, uh, the oysters, um, definitely made for a, a great meal and as you mm -hmm. agree of course uh finished off with a bottle of barks so yeah can't go wrong can't go wrong there yeah you know. sounds great yeah it's really uh really something else um and then so that was uh drago's out in the metairie location so i'm making my way my way uh back to um Thank new God. orleans <laughs> hold on we can't uh <laughs> Can't let YouTube uh, flag, yeah, <laughs> or else we don't get monetized. <laughs> Wait, we get monetized? You getting money for this? <laughs> How dare you? Well, we're definitely not going to do it now if that's the case. So, <laughs> um, but on my way back, uh, there was a a spot I wasn't sure where I was going to place in the itinerary, but I guess I ended up visiting uh, here uh, next. 
And um, this is a spot called Turkey and the Wolf. And it's um, it's a small restaurant, kind of, um, I don't know what area this is. I want to say it's like this area called the Garden District or the Lower Garden District. Um, and they are known for making some pretty stellar sandwiches. But I think the signature sandwich, I think the one that um, a lot of people f- go and maybe go to it, or maybe it's for tourists, I don't know. But a sandwich they're definitely known for is this um, fried bologna sandwich. Nice. Um, yeah. I think I saw this uh, initially from the Netflix show, like Somebody Feed Phil. That's um, that Phil Rosenthal from you know, producer of Everyone Loves Raymond. But um, in this, you know, an episode where he went to New Orleans, he visited this spot and um, it's a very interesting sandwich. It's uh, l- let me just show you here. It is a let me just say this is a Ooh. thick sandwich. It, I mean, it appears. Um, yeah, like a, like a thick sandwich. Um, you got that thick buttered or toasted bread. Uh, you can see the chips that are in there. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, also with some mayo, bologna, cheese. Um, the, the the bologna itself, though, is just it's just like a single slice of bologna that's fried. So it it's like thick or no. I mean, you can see like you can barely see it. It's like yeah. covered with the cheese. Right. So, not it's not, you know, I, I'm not either. But, you know, just trying Ooh. to get a little bit um, more of a, you know, an idea your lighting. Of, uh, yeah, don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's uh, is that it, a, what is that plate? It's <laughs> it's a good plate. Is that a McDonald's, Ronald McDonald, oh, and Hamburglar? You can see, you can see some adaptation of those characters. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I love it. It's great. Um, so I guess the the key in order to really attack this sandwich is to, in fact, smush the sandwich. But the chips. Well, I think in some cases that might actually um, be advantageous. So this would be a result of smushing the sandwich. You have, um, you know, you take, you just press it on, you compress the bread, you, um, you know, kind of uh, get the chips, you know, going, all crushed up. Um, so it looks more like, a, you know, Monte like a fry, <laughs> like a fried bologna sandwich that you might be used to taking a bite out of. So surprisingly, it's still a satisfying bite, you know, even after smushing the sandwich. But I think it's the okay. only way that you can really, I don't know, uh, really get it That's down. No, 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 no. People, I'm sure people can open their mouths wide enough for that. So you're saying that you would be able to take a bite of this sandwich? I would definitely try. Okay. I can open my mouth pretty wide. Yeah. All right. <laughs> um, not for hot but damn, though. No, I guess not. Um, but yeah, that's uh, this is from Tricking the Wolf. This was the only item I you know ordered from there because it was the item to get. So, okay. but um, I'm glad I did. I mean, it even, looks great. Yeah, I think it's. Uh, they also have a few other sandwiches that that people uh, really enjoy out there. Um, we'll have to we'll have to try next time. You know, I'm out there. So okay, so that's Turkey and the Wolf. Now, uh, after that is more kind of like a pit stop, but um, mm-hmm. still a, <laughs> a worthy addition uh, or worthy mention. So I'm dropping off my rental um, from. Uh, my visit to the plantation or whatever. And uh, I got a refuel for gas. So it gave me a good excuse to visit this spot. It's in the, it's near the quarter or at the quarter or something. Um, I'll say it's in the quarter uh, to get gas. And it's called um, key fuel mart. And um, the reason why I go to this particular gas station and not to any other like, actual branded name or well or other gas station that's probably closer is because this particular gas station serves great uh or is known to serve great hot food out of there so (laughs) you've got namely the fried chicken okay because i had you know i had 
tried to look for places where I could, you know, um, have some good fried chicken and there were a handful, but I think the way that the trip was just kind of playing out, it wasn't going to work out too well visiting Mm -hmm. too many spots, but I needed to have a hit of fried chicken while I was there. So this was my, this was my stop. So while I'm filling up for gas, you can go inside and you just order, you know, you just, they got a menu there. You know, it's like going to, con, you know, the convenience store or whatever. And you got the hot food there, except this one is filled with fried chicken and other, other fried items. Um, you can get them, you know, got dark meat, white meat, you know, whatever piece, you know, multiple pieces, get it with fries, get it with biscuit. Yeah. It's, um, Did you get it me, with a biscuit? No, just the chicken, just the oh, chicken. Okay. But let me tell you that chicken, um, was super good. I mean, like, yeah. uh, it was, it, it like kind of hits you. The spice kind of hits you, um, right up front, but it's, uh, it's, it's really nice and, uh, super crispy. And the, uh, the meat itself was, um, really moist. So, you know, I really enjoyed, um, you know, having that. It was, it was really good. Um, qualified for a gas station or not. It was, uh, it was a great, great stop. <laughs> Um, so I had a leg and thigh and, uh, those are really, uh, really enjoy those. So oh, nice. there are a handful of others, um, that I really wanted Gas to visit. station fried chicken? Well, um, or just local, um, f- oh, like food just fried chicken. convenience store or food mart kind of stuff. Oh, okay. But, um, I mean, you, you hit up a few, more than a few. Absolutely. But not for fried chicken. So, um, mm. actually I should have, uh, next time I'll, we should go to, um, Popeyes, right? Because that's Louisiana fried chicken. That's got to be yeah. good. I mean, told that that's uh, really good out there too. So, I don't know. Um, but uh, that is I mean, if it's good here. It's probably amazing over there. I bet. I bet. Yeah. Um, Popeyes is definitely up there, right? As far as mm-hmm. uh, fast food fried, fried chicken, chicken, hell yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so now I thought that you know we've been to all these places so far, right? Even from last time, mm-hmm. and. Even up to this point, it, a lot of places have just been not in the French Quarter. <laughs> just visited. That is correct. This is probably one of the few places, actually, that have been in the French Quarter. <laughs> <laughs> this, Café du Monde, uh, that's probably about it so far. But I think I need to catch up, right? So I need to catch up okay. on, on um, trying out some places in the French Quarter. So one of the places uh, to catch up to is a restaurant called uh, Mr. B's Bis- Bistro. And, nice. um, it's just kind of a fancy old you know, classic old school kind of looking place. You know, it's like a place where you can have a special occasion. You can dress up nice and fancy. It's got oh, this, okay. it's got this nice vibe, green interior, you know, wood paneling and things like that. Um, but, uh, as far as the food goes, um, because I feel like I had been behind on the gumbo train, uh, I wanted to try more gumbo. Now, I don't know if this was necessarily one of the best places to try. Not not to say that the food wasn't good, but I'm sure there were other examples of restaurants and things I, I should have visited, and I'll maybe get to that in a little bit. Um, but, but um, you know, I definitely wanted to try more gumbo. Um, so that was one of the starters, you know, that I, I had. And... Um, yeah, I mean the this was a more traditional gumbo. Um, let me see if I can bring that up for you. But um, this gumbo is just uh, again like a dark, you know, kind of stew, dark roux. You got you can see some of the bits here, maybe of um, uh, shrimp, some sausage. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are vegetables in there like okra and other things, Ooh. but they're they're more finely cut and you know kind of blended in there in the in the stew. Um, but, uh, One of the few vegetables I'm actually happy to eat. It, it's interesting, isn't it? And it is, uh, it is a quite a good, quite a good vegetable to have. Yeah. But, um, yeah, this, this, uh, this roux was, or this gumbo was definitely, um, not as intense, I feel like as, um, as the one I had from Drago's. It's a more mild, um, mm-hmm. I think it was, it, it's a more pleasant taste, you know, um, just, it, just like. I think it would serve everyone's kind of taste pretty well. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the, the consistency of the stew was, it was definitely a little thicker, which is nice. Um, 
and yeah, I mean, just the overall preparation, this is supposed to be like a, again, like a high, uh, a higher, finer dining kind of place. So I think you would expect, you know, high quality food, you know, and, and things like that. So yeah, can't, um, can't go wrong there. So yeah, it was, it was done well. So really, uh, I did enjoy that. Um, nice. the other dish, I'm trying to see, I don't know, I'm trying to find it and it's kind of nowhere to be found at the moment. But the other dish I I tried was yet another barbecue shrimp dish. And yes. it it just can't it just can't escape the barbecue uh here because it is a foundational food group. Um and again having had barbecue shrimp uh from the other spots we talked about, uh Liuza's in their po boy as well as um, Brighton's in in their um, their barbecue shrimp dish with the shrimp collars, I thought, shoot, I should try and see what it's all about. See, round out, uh, um, you know, the taste and see what uh, what to compare it to. So, um, this barbecue shrimp, though, again, was yet a little more different. It was closer to Brighton's uh, than Liuza's. Um, definitely more on the savory side. There's more. Uh, things like the Worcester and uh, pepper and things like that. Um, but it wasn't as strong or as intense as as I had at Brighton's. Um, in fact, I feel like it was it arguably maybe a little little on the plain side. Like you could taste it like it's there. But, you know, I feel like it's um, it just lightly kind of just lightly coats the shrimp. And um, it's it's just kind of there. I think the shrimp itself is also it, it was good, but let me tell you the shrimp, um, something I overlooked, not that it, not that it's a surprise if you actually do a little research, but, um, these were just, um, you know, these are just, uh, regular, like these are just, uh, what boiled shrimp, you know, regular, um, mm-hmm. what am I trying to say here? The shrimp is, uh, in those, um, it's something you got to peel. Let's put it that way. Oh, like um, like how to, uh, what was it? Like boiling crab was or sure. This is as close to a seafood boil as I'm gonna get. Okay. Um, but the but the shrimp itself, right, is um, it's not like fried, you know, or anything. It's it's like, you know, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so I had to uh, peel the shrimp, which mm-hmm. I'm not really a fan of. Let Did me put you? it. Why don't you just eat it? Because the shell is not cooked in a way where you can eat oh, okay. the entire thing. I see, I see. Yeah, so you do have to pick it apart. You know, you have all the nice bits inside. We talked about eating shrimp head before, mm-hmm. um, which definitely would do and did. But yeah, you have to peel off the skin, you know, the shell uh, to get to the shrimp. The shrimp itself is great, cooked well, nice and fresh. Um, but again, that barbecue sauce, um, again, wasn't really intense. It was kind of mild you know, and its flavor. Um, so, uh, but overall still, uh, you know, a good dish, definitely a very popular dish, uh, something that is, you know, worth trying. So, yeah. But, um, from that meal, um, there was no dessert to be had, not because they didn't offer dessert, but because my next stop, uh, would be dessert. And so, um, that spot is, uh, just around the corner from Mr. B's, it's called Brennan's. And Brennan's is a uh, another kind of, uh, like, lack of a better word, I guess, kind of a fancy restaurant. Um, they're known. They're actually quite known for serving, f- you know, food at all times of the day, whether it's breakfast, lunch, a nice brunch, um, or anything like that. Uh, but there's a particular dish. Uh, That is actually not a main dish. It's a dessert um, that they're known for creating and being the original creators of. And it's called a um, a bananas foster. Now, unfortunately, again, this is this goes to um, the question or the commentary that uh, or question why nice restaurants are dark. Okay, and I can't. Mm. It's hard to take pictures, but here's the best I could do, which is not the best at all. So here is the bananas foster. Okay. I should just look at pictures on the internet. Those are probably far better than what I've got here. Uh, actually, let me, let me look for that while I talk about this. 
But Bananas Foster, you seem to have uh, perked up to that. Does that sound familiar to you? Yeah. I've, I didn't know that it was whatever created or mm -hmm. I guess made there. Yeah. Like the original Bananas Fosters from this place. Yeah, the 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 oh. the the lore, I guess, uh, the origins of the story is that the chef, and this was, you know, uh, like decades, let's say, you know, uh, the mm -hmm. chef and the owner, you know, came up to the, um, you know, the head chef and say, oh, we have a party uh, coming up today, and I need, I want this like unique dessert. Get on it. So, leaves it to the chef to um, come up with something. And, uh, I guess as a result of that, it came up to be bananas foster. So bananas foster is, uh, a dessert with a caramel sauce. So, you know, you got sugar and butter and what makes, I think a part of what makes it unique is the use of, um, a look like a liquor, a liqueur, I guess, mm -hmm. um, that's, that's cooked in with the caramel in kind of a flambe. So it's like cooked while, you know, it's kind of added while it's cooking. And um, uh, in addition to that, uh, then you would also have uh, the bananas, sliced bananas, just regular bananas, like nothing specifically for frying or anything like that. Just like a typical, what are those? Like the Cavendish style bananas, you know, the ones you get at the grocery store. Mm -hmm. Whatever you're thinking of banana is there, that's what it is. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's kind of cooked in there a little bit and then, um, and then it's served alongside some vanilla ice cream. So, and then doused in that caramel sauce. So it sounds pretty good, right? Um, yeah. and, it is, and it is pretty good actually. And, and the thing is that they prepared for you table side. So even for myself, what you can do is that if you're just getting the dessert, because I think that's what a lot of people do, mm -hmm. um, you'll end up sitting at the bar and you can just go there and then you can ask for the dessert and they will still make it table side. <laughs> They'll still make it next hey. to you. Yeah. They bring like a small cart uh, with a small stove in there and yeah, they, you know, the real show is like when they add the, the liquor and just kind of comes up in flames, you know? Of course. Yeah. So... But uh, that um, that's the Bananas Foster. It's a fun dessert. Don't get me wrong. Um, I wish in this particular case, like, I'm sure like so many other recipes and variations have come up, right, uh, as a result of this. So I wish mm -hmm. like having had it from the source, yeah, I wish I, I could come across a recipe that would cook the banana like a little more, like really cook it, make it sweeter, caramelize the banana, you know. Um, mm. Or use a banana that's meant for cooking, you know, like plantain style, maybe. Okay. Who knows? But but cook the banana more, and then the um, the ice cream itself was, it was nothing. Honestly, not nothing um, like special. It in fact it was a little okay. ice. It was a little icy as far as uh, mm. the texture. So um, if you had a nice uh, vanilla ice cream, whether a French vanilla or even a custard based ice cream of vanilla, that would be. I think that would really hit the spot really nicely. Um, but, uh, yeah, but that's, um, I mean, it's nice to see like where it all started and where it all originated. So, mm -hmm. um, it's a great, don't get me wrong. It's a great uh, spot to try, but yeah, you don't have to go to get like the full meal, but if, if you're there, it's nice, you know, you get a night, maybe have a nice, make a brunch out of it or something or a nice meal. And then you have the bananas foster and, you know, bring that table side and have a little show, you know, for you. Yeah. Um, so that's, uh, that was Brennan's, um, both Mr. B's and Brennan's are there out in the, uh, in the French quarter. So now we're coming like towards the end, um, on the last day, um, of food things and the next spot uh, we start off with this, uh, the last of the beignets. Okay. So, um, the beignets in this case come from, uh, this spot called Cafe Beignet. 
And I think nice. he and I think he did catch me last time. I didn't make a slip on um, kind of referring to that spot when I was talking about Cafe Du Monde. Um, mm. That's probably because it was on my mind. But Cafe Beignet is um, is one of the other kind of original um, you know spots for getting a great beignet. Um, this is the original location in the French Quarter on Royal Street. Um, they are next to a police station. And actually, this nice. structure, from what I understand, uh, was part of the police station. It actually used to be storage for carriages, you know, when the police used horses. Mm. I think that's right. You can fact check me, but uh, that's where we're at. But it's been converted uh, to this spot that's now known as Cafe Beignet. So let's take a look um, at the beignets. They do look a little different than what we've seen oh, wow. before. Yeah. They're a little bigger. I'll tell you that. They're definitely bigger than um, either Cafe Du Monde or uh, Morning Call. But you can also see uh, they're a little different in shape, right? They yeah. maintain a relatively square shape, but you can see that some of them um, collapse a little bit. They have this little divot, little dimple. Um, of the fried dough. So one of them has kept, you know, it's, you know, full of, uh, it's fully risen, full air pockets and everything. But um, the others have managed to, uh, I'd say collapse, but maybe there's, I don't know, there's just a method to the madness that they've got going on there. But um, I think overall, from all the beignets, strictly speaking, I think I did like this just a little more. I think it oh, edges really? out, you know, even Cafe Du Monde, but, I mean, um, and got beignet the name. it got beignet and they serve it with powdered sugar without you <laughs> having to dole it out yourself. So I think that's a good start. Um, I don't know. I think the fry was, it was fried a little longer, like similar to morning call, but, um, I don't know. It's just kind of interesting also kind of biting into the, I don't want to say misshapen, but these differently shapen <laughs> beignets, you know? Um, it's just all dough. It's just kind of nice. Just kind of a nice, just bite of all dough in there. Um, but, uh, let me tell you, um, personally, I would just try to get a seat inside cause it's air conditioned. Cause otherwise outside you're just sweating outside. Um, additionally, the, uh, cafe au lait, of course they'll, they'll serve that too, but the cafe au lait, I don't know. I think that's where I go back to saying, go to Cafe Du Monde. You can't not go, just regardless. But I mean, like, as far as an overall, you know, experience and everything, I think Cafe Du Monde still edges out, um, especially when it comes to the Cafe au lait. Uh, this one was pretty good, but I feel like it was more cream heavy. So, I don't know, just um, uh, take that as you will. But like I said, they're all over the place, this drink, so I'm sure they'll come in many different you know, you get many different kinds all over wherever you go. But, um, yeah, so those are the three. So Cafe Du Monde, Morning Call, and Cafe Beignet. They've got several other locations uh, in the quarter and elsewhere, but this is the original one um, on uh, Royal Street. Um, now, let's see. As I was kind of wrapping up my visit on the last day, um, you know, just kind of, visiting some last minute places, maybe getting some, um, souvenirs and things, walking around French market, things like that. One other, a couple other foods. Uh, the next food I wanted, I definitely wanted to try is, um, is a sandwich, not a po' boy, but a different kind of sandwich called a muffaletta. And a muffaletta is basically a, an Italian inspired deli sandwich. Kind of got this round seated bun and it's a large, um, thing and and in there you have deli meats like salami ham you have provolone cheese and then you have this thing called the olive salad which is its own mixture of different ingredients like olives and carrots and things like that um you know and in this kind of olive oil uh spread that you top in the sandwich um and the place that um, is known for the sandwich is a place that where it originated from, that invented the sandwich, is a place called Central Grocery um, out in the French Quarter. And um, if you're there, 
you'll know where they are. They're kind of near where the um, where the French market is. Uh, let me see if I can bring it up here. But um, yeah, this this area here is like where the French market is, and this is where Central Grocery is. But Central Grocery um, is yeah the place where they they made the sandwich. But um, to my surprise, maybe, or to my discovery, Central Grocery itself is actually closed, um, I guess, due to some renovations or repairs that they're doing in the store. I think due to, um, I think, uh, hurricanes and other weather-related uh. things that were taking place. But, um, yeah, so unfortunately, you cannot visit the... Uh, the actual shop, but the sandwiches are still available um, at uh, the store next door uh, called Sydney's. So you can go to Sydney's and you can pick up their sandwiches um, and uh, you can have them. You can still enjoy them. You know, there are other places that serve muffalettas um, and perhaps those are other places that well, again, maybe visit on, on the next time, but, um, I visit, I, I stopped inside the shop in Sydney's, right. And, uh, I saw that they have the sandwiches they have, like they serve it as whole sandwiches or half sandwiches. All right. Um, let me, uh, see if I can find, um, in the meantime, like a picture of what the sandwich looks like, but, um, I was just originally going to get like half a sandwich because it is quite large, uh, this sandwich. But um, they said at, at the time I had gone, they said they only have them as whole sandwiches. They'll have the half sandwiches after like, I don't know, a certain time. Um, but I wasn't going to be there that long. So I'm like, mm, maybe I will come back. Um, here's a picture of, um, of the sandwich, a whole sandwich. It's a round bun, right? And um, with the seededness in there. And um, you can also see what the sandwich looks like inside, right? You got the deli meats, the cheese. There's that olive salad there along the top. Mm -hmm. So um, I thought, oh, I get only get half a sandwich. But then as okay. I was walking along, I thought, I won't have time to go back. I just need the <laughs> sandwich. Give me the sandwich. So I go back and I said, I'll, I'll get the whole sandwich. Um, and so, you know, my, uh, the, the person there, uh, reminded me, yeah, you know, the sandwich holds up really well, you know, if you're going to take it with you, you know, um, yeah, I mean the, the sandwich will, will hold up. So actually, so what ended up happening is that I ended up taking that sandwich back here to LA, um, and enjoying it here, like as like my meal for the next few days. So I packed it up in my, uh, you know, in the bag I was carrying, just took one bag. Uh, so I, I packed it all there and, um, yeah, I had the sandwich here. Let me show you, um, what the sandwich looked like relative to, uh, you know, what I was, what I had there. It's, um, that's, that, the that's me <laughs> holding the bag or of the sandwich, right? The packaging of the sandwich. So for scale. Um, it's a large sandwich. Uh huh. Yeah, <laughs> where, it's a big where's sandwich. The scale off that? My hand. I mean, yeah, I guess. But you can see they um they give you some instructions on how to you could eat it cold or you could heat it. And actually, the reheating instructions that I followed were perfect. They made the sandwich perfect. You could either put it in like the toaster oven, or you could just heat it in the microwave for a little bit. And either way, they turn out great. Like. Um, whether you want it hot or cold, um, you really can't uh, go wrong with that. It's a great sandwich. I I enjoyed it so much. I before I did, I did take a few pictures of that sandwich when I got home because it's a good sandwich. Um, yeah. So here's the size a, of a binder. Yeah, it's big. I mean, here's the you know a slice of a quarter of that sandwich. Again, we see the deli meats, the cheese, that olive salad. Um, here's a picture of the, uh, of the sandwich, right? The whole, like all four pieces. Um, it, it's a big sandwich. Um, 
But you know, honestly, my child, if I if I really had my way, I could finish this. I I could have finished this sandwich. I believe it. Yeah. But you had a lot of stuff to do that day. Absolutely. So really, um, this is a <laughs> this is a good sandwich. Jacket. Yeah. So a muffaletta is um a great a great type of food to try out. Um and so Healthy. yeah, this one was toasted. So this one I think uh-huh. I enjoyed this one probably the most. Toasting it um over microwave. The microwave actually turns out really good too, but obviously the toast adds a little crunch and the meltiness of the cheese. So it's like yeah, really enjoy that one. Um so yeah, I mean, so if if you're out there um, there are, again, at least there's one other place that comes to mind. I think it's called Verdi Marty, um, is another popular spot for muffalettas. Um, but central grocery is, you know, um, as far as, uh, the, the origin of the sandwich. So hopefully they'll reopen again and, uh, you'll be able to visit that. Um, yeah, but they, they're still sending their sandwiches next door at, at Sydney's. So, um, make sure you try that out. Um, as we're getting close, we have, um, Loretta's Loretta's is, uh, they have a location out in the French market and, um, they make these, uh, pralines. And so, and there are a bunch of other, uh, shops that make excellent pralines, um, which is a dessert that's usually made out of pecans. It, there are a handful of places, but Loretta's is probably one of the more known ones. And I think a lot of people go to. The thing is that they also serve um, savory beignets. So they have beignet, uh, beignets, but they serve them with like uh, crab or some oh. sort of meat or something like that. Something more savory. I'm in. Yeah, it's a very interesting take. So um, that sounds great. It, yeah, unfortunately, I did not get to try that. So, um, but the pralines themselves, as far as a sweet treat, is a great, great thing to to try. So that's uh, Loretta's. And that kind of, honestly, kind of wraps up uh, all the places, um, food places. Now, hopefully, if there is a next time, um, I definitely want to, you know, go back for more po' boys and um, and more gumbo. Um, I didn't have a chance to try some other dishes like uh, dirty rice or red rice, depending on the context. Uh, also, jambalaya, uh, of which there's also kind of distinction, you know, between Creole versus Cajun preparations um i want more fried chicken okay actually the main reason why i thought i would be able to, you know i wanted to go was um because of the restaurant willie mays which is like the most famous restaurant for fried chicken either mm-hmm. new, for new orleans and probably the nation honestly for some of the best fried chicken you could have but unfortunately they are closed because they are rebuilding or from a fire that they had earlier this year so Damn. they're going to be reopening Damn. hopefully sometime next year. So unfortunately, yeah, I had missed out and I didn't see that until after I had like booked everything and arranged everything. So, um, but obviously still had a lot of good places to, to eat, uh, and try out. Uh, we talked about those savory beignets from Loretta's. So hopefully you could try out those as well. Yeah. Yeah. And then, um, for more sweets. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's a thing at Mardi Gras called King Cake. Um, which I have heard, look, I think the cake involves cream cheese. So I think I nice. sold on that already. So <laughs> yeah, that's all you need. Um, and then there's this, these other things called the, like a doberge cake, which is, uh, not necessarily a seasonal cake like the king cake is, but it's just a, like a multi-layered, like thin multi-layered cake or something. So that'd be interesting to try. And, um, Yeah. Uh, more pralines. I think I only had a couple of pieces, so I n- need to try more of those. Um, I will say as far as planning, um, there were a few more places I could have visited had I planned better. I think one thing I uh, take for granted sometimes, at least here in LA, is like, you know, there's always something open, something available um, that I can visit for whatever I want uh, to try. But, you know, one thing I, I, I overlooked to consider is, you know, the schedule of when a lot of these restaurants are open um, or not open, namely the days of Saturday, uh, Sunday and Monday, a lot of these businesses are closed. Um, mm. And so um, I kind of overlooked that. So I'd missed out if I had planned that out 
better than I could have visited those places on another day. Um, but you know, I guess it didn't work out this time. So, um, I do know better to, to look out for that, but, um, something to keep in mind as well. So, um, yeah, but, but all considering, I think, um, you know, that, that was just, uh, a small drop in the bucket, if you will, for a lot of the places that you can try. Um, yeah. So hopefully, I don't know, my job, maybe, uh, we'll have to, we'll have to plan out something, um, get out there, uh, even in, in the heat. Maybe we'll have to go during a time of year where it's not so brutally hot because it mm. was, but again, it's always going to be humid out there, but maybe try a time when it's just not as much. So, um, yeah, I mean that's that's New Orleans uh, in the books and in my uh, in my stomach. So, I uh, oh, the whole city, yes, yeah, the whole <laughs> the whole city. So, hopefully, uh, hopefully that gave you a good idea of like some of the places to hit up and some places uh, to check out. There's, I mean, there's still a wealth of restaurants and um, other small places to to really discover. So, um, hopefully. Um, hopefully you're up to it. What do you think? I mean, at some point, definitely. Yeah. It all looks so good. Yeah. Can't wait to go back. So hopefully sometime soon. But, uh, looks like we've come to the end of another episode. Thank you for joining us. We are excited to bring you more of our adventures with good food and good people. Uh, you can reach out here at Instagram. I'm at Dumb and Hungry. He's at my underscore chow. Uh, you can email us at hi at dumbhungry.com where you can leave us your feedback and your love letters. Uh, you can find the videos here on YouTube. Won't you like and subscribe and smash? Uh, you can also find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and wherever else fine podcasts are served. But until next time, I'm Angelo. I'm my chap. And on your next food adventure, remember to try one of each. Right. Well, we're back again. Uh, we wanted to. Yeah. I know. I, Mitra thought we were done. He was actually ready to sign out, and um, I was so I was so yeah, done. He actually disconnected already. He had to actually call him. He's like, hey, we're not so done yet. Early. I was like, early night. Let's go. <laughs> well, we'll try to we'll try to wrap it up soon. But I did want to just mention a, a few things. You know, um, not food related, but still worth mentioning. Uh, while you're out there, I think one place. Uh, that would be worth visiting uh, would be a plantation. Um, so, you know, in addition to all the many uh, wonderful things that we've come across to know for New Orleans, as far as the food goes and the entertainment and just the great people and, and everything, of course, there is this historical context um, of a darker history, I suppose, of slavery. You know, uh, the Port of New Orleans is probably one of the was one of the most heavily trafficked uh, areas for slave trade and, and things of that nature um, and carries that history, you know, along, you know, with it. But um, I think it's important to kind of understand uh, that past. And I think a plantation is a great opportunity to uh, to learn about that. And so one of the, the place that I, uh, I had visited was the Whitney Plantation, about an hour away from the French Quarter in the city of Edgard. And um, it's, it's, I mean, it's very education focused. Again, the context of history, slavery, um, they don't necessarily try to, um, you know, uh, make light of, of it. They, they do share, mm -hmm. you know, what has happened there. Um, and, and the history of, of how things went down. Um, it's um, available. You can visit there and they're available in both guided and self-guided tours, uh, guided with someone, you know, from there to uh, talk you through um, the different exhibits and, and places as they walk you through the grounds. Um, and also self-guided tours where you can follow an audio device to kind of bring you along. 
I wanted the guided tour. Um, so that was uh, that was a good um, good move, I think. But they take you around to the different places, um, to the a lot of the the structures that might have been original to the uh, the area or at least period accurate. Um, and what's also great is that they built these memorials, these walls of names of, you know, everyone, all you know, the slaves that have worked there, um, as accurate as they as they could be, and um, you know, it's just a nice way to uh, again just learn history and appreciate uh, the past of where we are uh, now in the present. And uh, I'm I'm hoping uh, that there are other um, plantations or other, you know, areas that will kind of do something similar. Maybe there are, but I just, I just kept coming across that this particular one, uh, probably does it, uh, the best, I guess, or oh. does, does one of the better jobs of presenting that, um, mm-hmm. without just, just solely without the, uh, the glamour, right. Of, of, um, mm-hmm. of what these grounds look like now, but yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty good. Um, one of the, th- yeah, go ahead. I'm just curious, did, what, what was their, uh, product, I guess? Uh, was this particular, one? um, this particular one was sugarcane. Yeah. Oh, sh- oh okay. And they still, in a lot of plantations, they, they still grow these crops, you know, so there are still lots of sugarcane you see that in the ground. Um, I think originally they were saying that it was for, uh, for dyes, like indigo dyes, you know, the oh. plants for, Yeah. Um, but then they shifted to sugarcane, more profitable, but obviously, but also a lot more dangerous. They were saying it's far, you know, really? as far as, yeah, I don't know, like you know, sugarcane is not native to the area, so um, you know, to bring it over and the you know the way they have to cut the stalks is pretty dangerous, and the stalks oh. themselves, if you get cut, you know, the properties of the of the sugarcane uh, don't allow wounds to heal too easily. So I mean, like it's stuff like that. And then um, having to extract the liquid uh, from the sugar cane into these large, into these series of pots, uh, boiling, you know, like boiling uh, pots uh, to kind of refine and, and um, extract mm. uh, and gra- to be able to granulate the sugar from them um, was a dangerous task in itself. So, um, it yeah, it's crazy to um, kind of see um the the methods and the tools that were used to do that is um yeah i mean and and to kind of to and you know i'm not trying to make light of anything but it's like you're in this you're in this heat that's already like hot humid right um and so i mean like i can only imagine um just how much worse you know those conditions would have been um day in and out Right. Having mm-hmm. to and just doing something that you know, against your will and something you're like not used to doing um, or you're forced to doing is just uh, incredible, really. Um, anyway, but uh, but that's the Whitney Plantation. Um, so there are many others you can check out, but you can check out those. There are other plantations that come with a bundle that you can like go to a swamp, right? Do a swamp ride or something. Look at the find alligators and things like that. So, um, one other thing you could look at is the cemetery tours. Now there are a lot of cemeteries, um, and you could probably visit so many cemeteries, uh, on your own and, you know, you'll still see the, the wonder of these above ground cemeteries and tombs, but having a guided tour again, gives a little bit more history and context of how they came to be, why they decided to be above ground and, um, how people actually use them now. Um, one particular cemetery, the one that I went to in the French Quarter, um, requires a guided tour um, because I think because there are some notable names um, in there. And so I think people tend to, if they had their way, they would wander their way inside and, you know, try to, um, yeah, probably cause a little trouble uh, in there. But there are a lot of cemeteries uh, throughout uh, the city where you can visit and walk the grounds on your own. But this particular one, I think it's St. Louis cemetery. Number one, uh, requires a, uh, a guided tour. So again, by having that, yeah, you just kind of get a little more, um, 
context and insight as to how they came to be and, um, you know, how they serve, uh, the culture, uh, the people of, of, uh, you know, today. So, um, yeah. And then lastly, one other, one other, um, non-food activity I think I enjoyed, um, going to is actually a venue called, um, Preservation Hall. It's a very small, um, music venue in the French Quarter. It, it's it, kind of an unsuspecting place. It's just like, it's not even its own building. It just kind of along the, I don't know, you just kind of find it, uh, and it's just like a small door, a little hallway that goes into this small room, maybe not more than 50 feet, you know. Oh, wow. Um, but it can get packed, you know. You can buy, there are benches and things that you sit at, but there's also a lot of tickets for standing room, so that place can get packed. Um, but it's a great venue where you have a rotation of different musicians um, and that and that plays a lot of um, uh, jazz standards and other styles of music related jazz, Dixieland, big, you know, um, big band, that kind of thing. But a lot of jazz, uh, is probably what you're seeing. And so, um, and because the space is so intimate, you know, in this particular case, I think the group that I visited, nothing was amplified, you know, everything was just naturally, you know, uh, played natural acoustics, natural sounds, even the voices, you know, just trying to project. Um, you could hear just enough if you're in the back, but yeah, it's, um, it was kind of an interesting, kind of a nice space to know that you could just kind of use your natural surroundings to create some, uh, some big noise. Um, but preservation hall has been around for a long time, over 50 years, I think. And, um, again, that rotation of artists and musicians, um, again, to help preserve the culture, um, and give more, uh, context into the history of, uh, of music, uh, that, was yeah that was kind of appropriate um or very popular at that time and how that music has been preserved and evolved as well so um but that's preservation hall uh you do have to pay uh for tickets there Mm -hmm. but um i think if you could go to at least one um and yeah if it'll help you yeah appreciate that kind of thing so anyway but that's uh those were just some of the non food things that you can try out um because lord knows most people cannot probably will not be able to eat as many places <laughs> on their own as i have but um yeah those those were pretty good pretty good but uh yeah that's it you know from here so hopefully um new orleans again will we'll come out for you pretty soon <laughs> 